Hello, thank you to echo what Joe said. It's a beautiful day out there. So hopefully what we've brought you back in to observe will be some useful snippets. Um, and I think one of the things I've always found useful about Business Culture Connected is that kind of real tangible, tactical stuff versus that very superficial stuff that you sometimes get at some of these conferences. So I'm going to jump straight in and I um, would love each of our panellists to introduce themselves. Um, and just give us a little bit of a, an overview as to what purpose means in the context of either their current organisation, um, perhaps in the context of when we're sourcing talent for organisations, and, uh, and obviously where you've been previously, Janet. Thank you. I'm just checking it's on. <laughs> so uh, my most recent role was as Chief People Officer for Cambridge University Press and Assessment, which was actually two trading elements of Cambridge University the former um, Cambridge University Press and then Cambridge Assessment, we did exams, hence the little quip that was made about me marking people's homework. Um, a major source of income for uh, Cambridge University, in fact, 15 pence in every uh, pound that Cambridge University spends on research actually comes from the monies made by Cambridge University Press and Assessment. So that was a really useful hook for us in kind of encouraging people. But we had to integrate the two organisations during COVID and that was six and a half thousand people in 48 countries two very different cultures, which I can kind of touch on in a bit, but uh, a real challenge around how to use purpose as a, as a glue. Thank you. Hello, I'm Natalie Haley, People Services Director at CAE Technology Services. So our, our shared purpose is to transform lives and experiences through the use of technology, uh, which I think sounds a little bit grand. So part of my role and challenge is about trying to connect people at, um, a personal level to that purpose so then they can really sort of contribute to the bigger goal through their personal passions and our shared values. Hi everyone, I'm Graham Day. So I'm a business development leader for Gattaca Solutions. So the, the title, uh, my job title officially is Workforce Solution Architect. The reason for that is it's about working with organisations to design tailored outsource solutions. Um, that's really relevant, purpose is becoming really relevant to that because a lot of your success in designing a workforce solution is tailored messaging. Um, purpose can be a big part of telling the story of an organisation which is becoming increasingly important for candidates in their decision making on who they want to work for. Um, on top of that, I work for, I'm perhaps a consumer, if that's the right word, of a culture from lead that's designed, kind of been uh, evolved through leading with purpose over the last couple of years um, where we've been on a transformation and changed you know, united our teams behind a common goal and a common purpose so that's got some really interesting um, insights as well thank you um, Natalie you touched on something really interesting there and I it certainly resonates with me that sometimes a purpose statement if you like can feel a bit grandiose can't it and it's like actually it feels a bit superficial how do we kind of bring that to life um, I, I think speaking personally at Gattaca very much what we've done is we've almost translated our values into behaviours and we manage measure and assess people by those so um, I actually we've got some copies of our DNA doc today so if anyone's going through a similar exercise at the moment feel free to go and go and grab a copy um, I'd love to hear from you about how as a business you went about defining and articulating your purpose um, and was there ever a question of why are we doing this why, why is it a good thing to do <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's interesting that you mentioned the word why, because for us it always starts with why, and it's because people need amazing technology, and amazing, te amazing technology needs amazing people. Um, so already we're starting with our why, which is, which is fundamentally about our people and having them be the best that they can be. We then move on to our purpose, which is to transform lives and experiences um, through the use of technology, which, as you say, can feel really out there. So if you think of all the different roles that exist within your business, you know, from warehouse operatives to execs to finance people, and they'll think, well, how can I transform a life or experience? So the way how we've gone about it um, is through storytelling a lot of the time. So we have a culture book, which we release annually, which highlights our people stories, um, and we make a direct link to that. Um, but also through our charity um, sort of initiatives. So we've got a CAE Foundation and we work with sort of six charities um, which fundamentally work towards our purpose um, in terms of trying um, to reduce or remove sort of digital poverty. Um, and that really touches the hearts of our people because it's a real thing. Mm. And I think through that, a lot of people recognise that's 
actually what it's all about. And that is actually transforming a life, you know, where you've got a family of six children and one sort of device or no device or no internet. Yeah. And we provide those for people um, and we do it out of the goodness of our hearts. But if we wasn't a profitable business, we wouldn't be able to do it at sure. the same time. So it's a real fine balance, actually. Yeah. Um, but I do find that to try and connect people at a personal level, understand what drives them, you know, what gets them out of bed in the morning, because yeah. I don't think anybody gets out of bed and thinks, oh, you know, today I'm just going to be average. You know, I just want to be an average person. Everybody wants to do the best mm -hmm. and they want to do the right thing. So it's trying to tap into that yep. to ignite it, to yep. then work towards that purpose, um, which is tough. Yeah, <laughs> it, is, it is. Janet, you talked about, obviously, the, the Cambridge University Press and the amalgamation of those two organisations. At that point, did you look to redefine your purpose or, you know, was it something that was already being evolved? How, how did you tackle that during that sort of huge transformation that was probably happening as well? Well, one of the, the real issues was that the two organisations, Cambridge Assessment and Cambridge University Press, had a very different approach, which is really illustrated by their approach to reward. Yeah. So Cambridge University Press had a very traditional sort of publishing um, structure, which meant that people at the top of the organisation were very incentivised with bonus. Um, assessment was more like a some sort of an evolution from a traditional university um, sort of pay scale, and they had like a 1% bonus if you were lucky. So it was a real difference, and there was quite a lot of... Uh, you know, antagonism, but as you'd expect when this thing's announced in the middle of COVID, people were very suspicious, they didn't know what it was going to mean. And although these two organisations existed across the road from each other and actually did a lot of collaboration together and in the markets were going together to customers, for the people back at base who were already in quite a state of kind of high anxiety anyway, it felt very frightening. So we really focused in on this idea of profit for purpose yeah. and that actually it was, you know, similar to what you were saying, Natalie, it, it, that idea that you can, if you can benefit, you can actually do more good. So we had some, you know, some trump cards with things like Cambridge um, Partnership for Education, which did some fantastic work with Microsoft and UNICEF, developing um, a passport for refugee children in camps who could then continue with their education and wherever they landed then in the world they would be able to sort of continue and take that next step because as you can imagine being you know Myanmar was one of the places we were working it was really powerful that these kids then could their life wasn't on pause so we use things like that and similarly we did storytelling we really talked about that strategic narrative why we were doing what we were doing mm -hmm. but really focusing on people aligning to that purpose you know we're all in this together it doesn't matter which organization you started it didn't matter which side of the road you came from um, the reward issues didn't go away, but we, <laughs> as they ever, do <laughs> they, they ever, um, but, uh, but, you know, we really used that and leveraged it and then embedded that into our employee value proposition. So everything we did really came back to that sense of purpose, um, because it was that balance of an organization that had to act commercially, but was technically not for profit. And, and just the anxiety people were really feeling at the time. Yeah, through all that change. I think um, that's actually quite a nice link in terms of that EVP piece and how you then bring it, bring it to life. But Graham, really interested to hear whether through your interactions with customers, um, if purpose is something that comes to the table when they're talking about we have talent challenges, we think it's because of X or Y, does, does purpose lend itself to that at all? Yeah, well, purpose works across talent management in all areas so from acquisition right through to development right through to retention so there's a lot of research that shows that candidate decision making is increasingly or well, purpose is becoming an increasingly important factor in that likewise there's a lot of research that suggests that purpose is a key tool for retention what we see at the front end when we're working with clients to put in place talent acquisition strategies is clients being a lot more explicit about it realizing that purpose and values that are aligned to purpose are a key part to their story and key for them to get to the candidate community to attract them into the business. I think um, you mentioned reward, you know, salaries and benefits packages, while still important, aren't, you know, a lot of research shows that candidates are placing as much importance on purpose and values as they are on salaries and benefits package. So companies are having to be explicit about this. And on top of that, if you look at it from a kind of positive perspective, companies are trying to embed purpose. They're trying to embed values into the way they do things. Naturally, then, if they're getting that right, they're keen to be talking about that externally and getting that message out to the market and using it to benefit all aspects of their business, of which hiring is one of those things. Mm. Yeah. I think it's interesting, that, that point as well. Um, 
I think quite often people fall into the trap of thinking, oh, it's a, it's a Gen Z thing. They're interested in purpose-driven organisations, but, but actually perhaps people who are a little bit more seasoned in their career, shall we say, it doesn't matter to them as much. Um, and I know something we're looking to do as a business is when we're advertising roles for our engineering um, customers, having them listed as green jobs, if you like, so having a positive impact on the environment. And again, it's those small little tweaks that you know we know that customers are saying, actually, it's important for us that people understand that we, we, you know, these things matter. They matter to us and future generations, and, and so we want to be promoting those things. Yeah, just to add on to that, you're absolutely right. It crosses all age demographics. There is research and studies that show that it's increasingly important to the next generations yep. and the future generations. So for organisations, it's becoming something that they need to be more and more mindful of when developing their strategies to attract those people in. Yeah. Okay, so... You go about perhaps working collaboratively across the organisation or maybe it's a more of a kind of top-down, done-to process, but ultimately you build out your purpose, perhaps vision, mission, values. Um, you start to storytell within the organisation. I'd love to hear, and I'll start with Janet this time, how, how do you um, then see it actually at play in the organisation? Um, is it a lens that's applied when you're making decisions? Um, how does it kind of really come to life? Because that, for me, I think is the important bit about this stuff, right? Yeah, I think it's absolutely vital. And I think otherwise you're in real danger of it just being glossy words on a wall. And, you know, you can have a, a shop window that looks beautiful because you've got a great EVP. If people come in and actually it's rubbish, then, you know, and I think some conversations, was it Perry was talking about the induction, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's a classic, isn't it, where people come in and think, oh, good grief, what have I, you know, what have I signed up for? So we certainly used um, really the concept of putting the employee experience at the heart. We really put that at the forefront of what we were doing. We developed agile HR techniques turned a lot of our, our people into more of a product manager mm -hmm. than, a, than a traditional HR role. We were lucky we had a big change management team already. We had internal comms already. So we were able to really listen to people, understand the moments that mattered. And we applied that lens. You know, we developed lots of different personas, different ages, different people from different sides of the road, yeah. different types of jobs, and really wanted to understand what would that look like for them. Because you can feel excited about an organization's purpose, but actually if you come in and you feel you're not treated in a way that's aligned with mm. that purpose, is very, it's actually worse than telling them, you know, giving them a more honest, yeah. <laughs> unfiltered version of what the organization is actually like. But for me, you know, the agile HR aspect of it is really Really increasingly important it, and it was actually the only way we could cope with the huge amount of work we had to do anyway right. in terms of the integration yeah that makes sense Natalie how does that play out in your organization so I think in a number of ways to be honest I think from a decision-making perspective uh, the question we always ask is culture first which I guess is another layer to purpose all of those sorts of things but for us it's asking what do we want to do? What feels like the right thing? Mm -hmm. And we're normally all in agreement. Um, and what can we actually do? Yeah. So sometimes it's not always possible. So we go, okay, so where can we meet in the middle um, in terms of that? And then to communicate, sort of openly and honestly with people in the business to understand what's behind our decision making. So then they do actually get it. Because I think a lot of the time we'll go out with a message or a decision um, and people don't understand how we got there. Yeah. Um, so even if it's the best thing since sliced bread, they're not going to be happy with it because they don't understand how we got there and they weren't part of that decision. So I think open communication is definitely, um, yeah, a crucial thing for us. But I guess just fundamentally putting the values of the business into our decision making at all levels and being able to talk about it openly. Good, OK. Graham, in terms of, again, perhaps a customer perspective um, on this or kind of more broadly from your role, how, how do you see this at play? Do you know, I'll, I'll actually answer this from our perspective. So I mentioned that my role is about designing workforce solutions with our clients. That's the ideal scenario. The, rea the real scenario is usually it's participating in a competitive tender where we design <laughs> that uh, solution for our client. And actually, the way we would view a tender when it come out to us and the way we, 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 would, we would apply a lens of how aligned is this with our purpose, so that on twofold, that would be how aligned with it, with our purpose is it, i.e. putting culture first, is it in conflict with our purpose, is this organisation that we're going to be tendering for in conflict, is their purpose in conflict with ours, does it work against what we're trying to achieve widely as an organisation, but secondly, and coming back to the point about having reasons for when, when we're talking to employees and explaining our decisions, having reasons for those decisions, 
we would strongly say, well, if there's a conflict in our alignment our, of our purpose with the organisation that are tendering, um, that we're tendering or looking to tender with, then we're not going to be potentially competitive because aligned purpose is becoming very, very important in partnership agreements and businesses working together. So, yeah, in, in those two areas, it's the lens of how does it align with our purpose is really, really important to our day-to-day -day decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think one thing that I observe as well in, in my role, obviously, internally, um, is how are we holding ourselves to account for for the kind of vision, mission, purpose, values, again, that we've put in place. So I talked earlier about this DNA document, which is almost like our, our kind of values playbook. I know there's different terminology for these things. And in there, we've got our champion and our challenge behaviours. And some of it is as basic as actually that informs, we have quarterly performance review process, we have a scorecard. People have to demonstrate how they've lived those values or how perhaps they've challenged a challenge behaviour or also perhaps lean into the fact that we're human. Sometimes, you know, something nibbles us and, and we behave in a way that perhaps doesn't reflect our values, but we, we can hold our hands up and, and recognise it and move forward through it. So I know that, you know, there have been times where we've had to have conversations. We're a sales business. We have some very successful salespeople and sometimes their behaviour isn't always what we would love to see. Um, and we have to hold ourselves to account and remain authentic by challenging them with that behaviour. And I think just having this kind of, this guide, blueprint, you know, however you'd want to term it, certainly helps us, helps us remain authentic to that, that value set as well. Just to add on with um, customers and decision making, because obviously tackled it from our perspective, but, and to your point around us really looking at the behaviours of our people, the customers are looking at values and behaviours of us quite intrinsically when they're making that decision about who they're going to partner with. We're going to become an extension of their team. You know, recruitment solutions, workforce solutions, it is a saturated marketplace. We've had quite a lot of success in the last year and the differentiator has often been our people and the testimonials, the feedback we've got is we can really see ourselves working with you because the values that we're displaying, the behaviours that we're undertaking, are in line with what they're looking to uh, looking to have within their organisation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'd love to know, um, perhaps from experience or, or things you've heard, case studies you've read, um, how do you test the stickiness? How do you test whether or not actually, you know, we probably come from a place of, of course, people are living and breathing it, or we've got some examples of where it is working. How do you test how much it does actually permeate through the organisation? I'll start with Janet. That's the age-old question, isn't yeah. it? So I think the approach I've always taken is that you've got to have a number of data points, kind of qualitative and quantitative. And I think the point you made about salespeople perhaps not necessarily living the values, it is true that you, know, you only need one or two cases where people see something that's very different from what what's, it says on the wall or says in the book, and they can quickly become quite disillusioned. Um, certainly, there's all the traditional things like looking at attrition, looking at engagement scores. Um, but we certainly did through the kind of, again, through the sort of agile approach, really gather a lot of information from communities of practice, from different networks within the organization. We also applied a bit of science. So we, we did um, have a data scientist within the, the people team. Okay. We, um, we used large language models to, interp to um, sort of interrogate quite a lot of the information we'd be getting back from people. We used software to look at all the sort of free text we got from our uh, survey results. So we really set ourselves some goals around looking at the whole picture, mm -hmm. qualitative and quantitative, rather than traditional sort of, you know, attrition and engagement, which also were good indicators that, that the um, integration went reasonably well. Um, but there was lots of other data points we could have as well, those moments that matter, as we, we yeah. like to call them. And then I think it's back to that communication about really pushing those stories back out and saying, this is what we've done, this is why we've done it, this is the change we're making, and not being frightened to sometimes say, do you know what, we got that wrong. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I learned to Teams Live events for sort of four or 5,000 people at once which Teams Live, for anyone who's used it, it's a bit like just being broadcast on telly. You can't, you know, you can't see the audience. You don't um, even see the Q&A coming in or anything. And you're just having to sort of, for somebody who actually really probably six or seven years ago was terrified of kind of standing up in front even of a crowd of this size, it was a truly terrifying experience. <laughs> but I do think that you can't underestimate that authenticity. I know it's a word that's really overused now. 
but actually in times when people's psychological contract is shaky with an organization, just being able to say, do you know what, I don't know exactly what that new pay, pay framework is going to be like. No, I don't know what your bonus is going to look mm. like, but we do really value you and we do really value your skills and we'll give you lots of opportunity if you stick with us. It did actually ultimately make a difference, which was great. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Natalie, you talked about, I think, publishing something annually. Yes. Uh, that's yeah. a, that sounds great. Talk to us a bit more about that and obviously anything yeah, else sure. that you want to... So we have an annual culture book. Um, so we're just working on volume five at the moment. Um, each year it has a theme. So last year we launched um, our newest uh, sort of value, which is to advocate belonging. Um, so there was a theme that ran all the way through it in terms of where people have shown acts of advocating belonging. Um, so it talks about our aspirations mm -hmm. in terms of what we want to be doing. It talks about our purpose, our strategy, but also the people stories and aligning it to our values um, from a personal development perspective, a professional development perspective, new starters, interesting stats. Yeah. Um, so it's very internally focused. It's not an external document at all. Um, it's quite personal, I yeah. think, for a lot of people. So it will talk about you know, their coaching and mentoring journeys, um, you know, and where they've come from and where they are now. So, yeah, it's, it's growing. I think it started about 60 pages and the last one was 87. So I've been told to keep it in the middle somewhere this yeah. time. Um, <laughs> but people love it. You know, they love a physical book in their hands. They love being able to look and go, oh, look, you know, there I am. They take it home. They show their friends and family. Yeah. And that's what it's all about. You know, you start to advocate it and then people go, actually, that looks like a really good business. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Great people. way to get yeah. referrals. It's just, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, I love it. And I also love, like you said, it kind of puts the onus back on the colleague to say, oh, I want to share my story, which is yeah. nice, isn't it? People love it. Yeah, they yeah, really yeah. Do. Brilliant. Okay. Um, Graham, I don't know if you've got anything to add on that point in particular. No pressure. It was a bit of a curveball. That question wasn't actually on the list, but um, I thought I'd ask it. <laughs> yeah. The, well, the, the only point I would make is, I think, to when you're leading with purpose, to... Uh, Obviously, we can have a lot of playbooks and stuff that, which are all really, really important. But actually, some of those decision makings at the top that really enforce that senior sponsorship on we are going to live by this purpose, that sometimes would be seen as really difficult decisions against other things like profit, etc. And I think some of the things that we've made, we, we've walked away from a couple of contracts that were high revenue contracts on the basis of a believed disalignment with the values that we're putting in place, being perhaps uncomfortable with the way that we felt our colleagues were being treated, etc., in those relationships. And I think that was a really defining moment in, okay, we're really living by these values because we're actually going to walk away from profitable uh, situations by prioritizing the values that we're putting in place. And when you start to make those sorts of decisions, obviously you need to balance that completely. One of the responsibilities we've got to our employees is to keep the, the lights on and keep, keep money coming in. But when you, once you start to make decisions that are really led by the purpose, that can have a real impact on the way that then the employees are engaging with those values. I think that's a really good point. And I'd love to hear from both Natalie and Janet on whether they see the focus on purpose paying dividends in, in their businesses or where perhaps purpose and profit is common to conflict and, and what's one. So I'll start with, I'll start with Natalie this yeah, time. Yeah, sure. Um, so I can see um, examples on both sides of the fence, actually. So I think there definitely have been times where it has come into conflict. And as I say, that, that sort of culture-first approach of decision-making is something that we overlay to support us through those times. But pay review is always one of those yeah. times. Um, <laughs> You know, you mentioned it before where people, you know, it's very emotional, mm. isn't it, for people? So um, I think in terms of that, that is definitely a point of conflict. Um, I think in terms of complementing it, so we look at things like NPS, you know, net promoter scores. So what are our customers actually saying about us? Um, and that's how we measure the effectiveness of our purpose, because we recognise that a purpose is nothing without people driving it. Mm -hmm. um, it literally is just words on a wall and people aren't going to buy into it if you don't really deliver on it. Yeah. So I think in terms of those moments where, yeah, we recognise that it's our people who will drive our purpose. Um, without it, it is, it's meaningless, yeah. really. Yeah, absolutely. And Janet? 
Yeah, I mean, I mentioned before about the, um, the money that goes um, for research for Cambridge from press and assessment, and certainly we, during the process process of the integration, we really leveraged that as a story because it, it felt like a really good way of connecting people to the university. Um, but I think, you know, it's not an easy one. I think the issue around pay and bonuses and things was, was for us still uh, at times very, very challenging. But yeah. I, I just think leveraging every opportunity, telling those stories as much as we could really made a difference. But we did just have to lean into the fact that, it, yes, we were trying to make a profit and it was profit for purpose. And this was the purpose and this is what we were doing. And we expected everybody to really kind of, you know, coalesce around that with the different types of roles they were doing. But there were times when I think particularly in the context of the cost of living and things like that, yeah. where you know people were looking at sort of Cambridge, which is a wealthy institution in itself as it is, and saying, "Well, hang on a minute, you know, I'm having trouble with my paying my utility bills or whatever else." So it was definitely at times felt like quite a tightrope. I couldn't sit here and say we had all the answers, but again, I think it's just that piece around kind of communication yeah. and honesty and openness. Um, and sometimes having to challenge senior colleagues about some of the decisions perhaps they wanted to make yeah. and the impact that might have through the organisation down to the ground floor and getting them really to think about that in the boardroom rather than just hiding behind HR said you're going to get this pay rise. Yes, yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? I was in a, in a uh, round table earlier and the focus was on resilience in the workforce under times of change, but actually words around trust within the senior leadership community and, and that sense of caring and connection um, I think all really lends itself well to actually, is this a legitimate purpose or does it just sound nice and look good in your annual report? Um, it, it is how it's brought to life, isn't it, in the organisation? So I think we've got some time for questions, but I'm just going to put one, one more question to each of my panellists before we, um, we open the floor, if there are any questions. Um, I guess final thoughts on whether or not you were part of the inception of the, the purpose within your organisation now or, or you've driven it forward since. Any kind of major lessons learned, things you'd definitely do again or do slightly differently in future? Um, I, I'll, I'll start to give you a quick chance to think, but we, we've done two since, since I've been in post. Um, we, we've kind of came up with an EVP, which was essentially all built around our, our then vision mission, purpose and values. Um, and then just post COVID, we, we did our new one. And I think for me, it probably is a cliche, but it really was, we didn't embed it particularly well the first time. Actually, it was probably a lot shinier. We had a great big launch, all the classic things that people say retrospectively, they probably didn't do very well in terms of then actually, how was it lived and breathed through the organization? And it quite quickly became quite stale. And I think some of that was because our leadership team was very different at the time as well. Um, but I think something we've been very intentional about this time round is using it as a lens to make decisions, talking to our customers and our internal colleagues about it a lot, and then obviously using it as a mechanism to reward, performance manage, support, um, and enable our colleagues really. So cliche, but just the embedding of it and thinking through that bit. Yeah, I would say that the EVP for me is really, really about how does it touch every point in the employee life cycle and for each of those points, what does it feel like? What's the, literally, what is the experience for people? Mm -hmm. And really, really making sure that that's truly, truly embedded. The other thing I would just add around the kind of behaviors and expectations, something I've done, you may have this, apologies, I haven't looked at the book, but having something that talks about what not to do and how not to do something, I've certainly found is incredibly powerful because it gives people permission where they can see, oh, actually, it isn't okay for that person to be doing what they're doing. And now I've got a mechanism by which I can have that conversation. Yeah. Totally agree. Natalie? Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking, actually, as you were talking, and all I had going on in my head was to cut the crap, to yeah. be honest, because <laughs> I think fair. a lot of the time you do. You yeah. Put, you put a lot of stuff around it, and you think, oh, yeah, this is great, but then you don't live and breathe it. You don't yeah. behave it. You don't walk the talk. And I think, for us, that's been the hardest thing, is where, actually, as an SLT, we hold each other to account. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to turn into an argument. It can be, actually, is that really in line with our values? Yeah. Um, just another thing that I was thinking about earlier was in COVID. So during COVID, actually, our engagement levels, which all talks about our purpose and values and those sorts of things, it rocketed. So mm. it was so high mm. during the hardest time where nobody was getting pay increases, where nobody was sat with people having a social or doing all those things that people think are important. Yeah. But we just had an overwhelming sense of gratitude. Um, and I think that really came through. And that's about that personal connection. That was something that we reflected on a lot was 
we've just got to cut all of the nonsense out and yeah. just get real and yeah. really humanise it. You know, people are here for a reason and they want to do good. If that doesn't match with our good, then that's absolutely fine. We wish them well. Yep. Yeah. So, good point. I would reinforce that area of senior sponsorship, so it's rehashing a point I've already made, but I think having the senior leaders living and breathing it is so important. I think about our business and the way our mission and values is constantly reaffirmed by our CEO and our, and our senior leaders who, who live and breathe, but they do so authentically. So it's not like a constant reaffirming it so that it's going to be drilled into your head. It's, mm. it's very authentic. It's very key to, to their um, overall message and, and it's constantly reinforced as a result. And the, the last point I'd make, I think, is timing. So making sure that your purpose is in line with you get the timing right in terms of a launch if you want to call it that but you're also in keeping with the times in society i think back to when we started ours it was actually driven a lot by covid yeah. wasn't it and we yeah. we recruitment obviously was a difficult um industry to be in during covid because people were making cutbacks they weren't hiring recruitment is synonymous with a lot of cold calls and sales calls if you're cold calling people trying to make money from them it's not the best look in a time of real struggle so we changed things up and, and had a, a campaign if you like called change in the game which was all about how we could support our clients through it um the theory of re uh, reciprocity so it, it was completely moving away from the financial element of recruitment and moving towards a bigger uh, purpose and then I think from that we've then moved on to have a more formal purpose which people have naturally aligned to because they've already started to live it a little bit mm -hmm. yeah it almost became self-fulfilling didn't it as a yeah. result of that thank you Joe I don't know if we've got any questions <laughs> you thought it was all over <laughs> Thank you. And don't forget to use the app to put your questions in. Um, I've got it here. I can uh, put them to the panel or we can come around with a mic. So um, first one, actually, for you, Claire. So you're in the hot seat now. Um, the values playbook that you talked about, yeah. um, Zoe Tillotson was wondering what, who was the audience for that? Was it just leadership or was it everyone? In no, there? all of our people. So, um, yeah, it, it was basically a booklet developed um, by my colleagues, actually Elliot and Jack, that are in the audience um, and absolutely designed for everyone. It's called our DNA. We're called Gattaca. So it's obviously a little bit of a spin on, on the helix, but um, actually exactly to Janet's point. And the reason why I liked it when I first started going through it, I'd been on maternity leave when they developed it. And I came back, I was like, this is so practical. So it's, you know, principles around our values, which are trust, professionalism, ambition, and fun. And then we have exactly that champion and challenge behaviors aligned to each of those values. Um, and, you know, I have a quarterly score, performance scorecard with our CEO, and he'll judge me on how I behave as well and those values. So it, it really does go all the way through the organisation. Um, but it's very understandable. And I think, to Natalie's point, um, I think it was Natalie, it might have been Janet, where sometimes you, you, you want to call out somebody's poor behaviour or you've observed something that makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, some of the wording we have in there, I think just helps depersonalise some of that calling out of. So I referenced it earlier, but we have something in there that is brave enough to tell the truth, kind enough to do it in the right way. So to be candid, if we think someone's been a little bit of an idiot with how they're trying to give feedback to someone, then we'll just say, hang on a minute, you know, brave enough to tell the truth, but let's do it in the right way. Um, and that does help. We've built a little bit of kind of um, company, I guess, um, lexicon or narrative around around some of that language as well, which has been useful. That's really that's really interesting. I, I, I was you've kind of taken the wind out of my sails with where I wanted to go with a follow up question to that, actually, Claire. Um, how often does that are people confident and capable and able to actually challenge upwards yeah look i mean perhaps i am in a role whereby it's probably i'd love to ask some of our people that have been in the business for two weeks to say look you've seen something done wrong but actually if I look at, we've got lots of ways that people can communicate with us. We've got a monthly pulse survey, but we've also got a monthly Q&A with a CEO. And you just see some of the content of the questions that go on there. And you know that there is that comfort that actually we've got psychological safety. Certainly for the most part, I'm sure there's always going to be parts of the business that, or people within the business that feel perhaps um, a little bit less comfortable, really challenging in an honest way. But we encourage our people to, because because we do it quite openly in forums as well. So, um, but Graham, I don't know if you've got a view of that as one of our colleagues in the business. 
Exactly that. I think um, the senior leadership team, we've got openly encourage it. So we have regular Q&As. Interestingly, your point about be, um, uh, be, kind, uh, be brave enough to, to call something out, but be kind in the way you do it. We had that where we have an open Q&A and people were putting anonymous um, questions in there that were probably a little bit not what we would want and the, the CEO called that out I will answer any question you want me to answer but you, you're brave enough to come and ask me to, to my face and let's have that conversation and I think those sorts of constant um, platforms for people to ask those questions and then the platform for Matt to reaffirm those values all the time is, is really important and really key in how we've done it I think there's a couple of, couple of comments in the chat which and what, one I, I hear a lot, and I, I don't, I'm not suggesting that you guys would have the answer to, which is that's fine in a, in a slightly larger company, but what if you're in an SME and it's the CEO who's the sort of maybe the CEO and founder who is a, behaving appallingly? How, you know, how, how, do you, how do you go about that? I think maybe that's just a, you know, a what if question. Maybe there is an answer. I'm, I'm not sure. Anyone want to try that one? I think it depends how brave you're feeling, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> how much you need the job. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think it's a, it's a really tricky question, but I mean, I guess there's always that, that sort of holding a mirror up to them in such a way that, you know, if you want to be successful, you know, and sometimes you have these conversations, I mean, particularly someone like Cambridge, you can imagine quite a lot of the founders are, uh, you know, um, very clever. And uh, with being very clever, sometimes there are gaps, perhaps in other areas. Um, she said diplomatically, she could. Um, and um, you know, sometimes just getting someone to understand the impact um, can be quite powerful. Not always, mm. but um, yeah, I yeah. think you just have to make professional choices about what you can mitigate, what you need to challenge. Um, but I think in any organisation of any size, you have to have good, authentic dialogue. And interestingly, we switched off anonymous questions in our Q&As during the integration because in fact a couple of times I actually literally on a call said you know I'm, I'm happy to answer questions but actually you know in the same way that I'd call you out if you uh, if you were found you know sort of bully someone else or you would want to call me out if I was bullying you you know can we just all be kind to each other because it's actually tough for everybody mm. um, and that did actually land you know it did make a difference because again it's that sort of humanity isn't it authentic so and modeling the way you want people to behave mm. authentic lovely um, we've run out of time um, so thank you very much. Thank you for putting your questions in, folks. Thank you very much to our panel. No problem. Thank you. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you. And as I said, there are copies of this, so if you're looking for inspo...